The following interview was conducted with Professor with Henry Weiner, Professor of Biochemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, May the 12, 2009, at his office in the Biochem Building. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Professor Weiner. Good Thank afternoon. you. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and early years. Okay, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1937. I don't have any real recollections about early childhood until maybe the age of five or six or so. And I remember part of the Second World War with rationing and things like that. Uh, my parents were working people. Um, my father had evening he would deliver telegrams. My mother would get them during the day and type them out and my father would deliver them in the evenings and I would often go with him. Um, my, then we moved in, we stayed in Cleveland until 1950 and then we moved to San Antonio, Texas where I went to um, through 8th grade through 12th grade. In San Antonio and or Texas at that time they were segregated schools so I graduated from a segregated high school. And then, uh, by pure accident, I went back to Cleveland. It wasn't the intention of returning to Cleveland, but I received a, a nice scholarship from then Case Institute of Technology, now Case Western Reserve, and I started there in 1955. I finished my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering in 1959 and had every intention of working in a pilot plant as a chemical engineer. But in 58, there was a recession in the chemical industry and in 59, um, they basically the chemical industry was hiring for production and sales, and I wanted to be in a pilot plant doing more experimental work. So um, I decided I would go to graduate school and get a master's in chemistry with the full intention of returning back to being a chemical engineer. My ideal job would have been working for Standard Oil of New Jersey and living in Manhattan with a sports car and commuting every day to go out there. Well, 40 years later, my son lived in New York City and worked in New Jersey, but it wasn't in the chemical industry, so at least one of the winers fulfilled the fantasy that I had um, for <coughs> reasons that were actually kind of interesting. Um, I was going to stay on at Case, I undergraduate school for a master's degree. They got a new chairman who came in sometime during my senior year. He called me in and said he doesn't like the idea of undergraduates staying at the same school. He'll let me stay for a master's degree because I was admitted, but I'll have to leave immediately afterwards. So I decided that really didn't sound like a friendly environment. And I was doing some paid research for a professor, his name was Astle, and he was a graduate of Purdue. And um, I told him about the situation. So this is like March of my senior year. And he said, well, let's go apply to some other schools. So I applied to Purdue and two other schools and got accepted to Purdue. Those days they didn't do interviews or anything. So I joined the faculty, sorry, I joined the graduate school in chemistry department in 1959 with again the intention of just learning a little bit of chemistry and leaving but it's the first time I got exposed to more theoretical chemistry and ended up getting a PhD and then after that I switched to biochemistry I can tell you about that in a few minutes if you okay, like in there. good uh, let's go back a little bit to couple tell us a little bit about what college was like were there any activities or what was college there in the Cleveland area when you went there case, case. was tell a little about the school because Dr. Hansen had got his degree from Case. Right, yes, I'm aware of that, and mm -hmm. I think it was a little bit, I think it was a little bit before me, but I have to remember the but times I, that he was there. Yeah. Um, case was not a fun school. I mean, How did you happen to uh, get the scholarship? Did you apply for it, or? Well, it was interesting. When I was um, graduating from high school, it was in San Antonio, Texas, many of my high school friends were going to the University of Texas, and I really didn't want to go where these people I went to high school with. So I applied to a number of schools that were um, studying science. My interest was really to study chemistry at that time, though as I said my degree is chemical engineering. And um, I gave my mother, who knew how to type, a number of places if she would type a letter for me. And she on her own wrote a letter to then called, she wrote it to Case School of Applied Science even though the name has changed. And I filled out the application and got the scholarship. Now at that time it was a big scholarship. It was $500 a year. Tuition was 750 when I started. When I graduated from college, I still had a $500 scholarship and tuition went up to 1400 I know by today we think that these are very low prices, but at that time when pay was under a dollar an hour, it you was a... You have to put it in that perspective. The time. It, was, it was pretty expensive. My parents had no money to help me out, so I basically worked my way through school. Um, so with the scholarship and jobs that I had... Um, Did you live on campus? 
I lived um, on campus my freshman year. All freshmen, out-of-town freshmen, had to live on campus. I joined a fraternity, a social fraternity, and I lived there my sophomore year. Then my junior, senior year, I got an apartment with two other friends. So the three of us had our own apartment for two years. The, there was activity. I was involved in a little bit of social activity, but it, it was nothing like a school like Purdue with what they had to offer. So, And also, I had to work on Saturdays. I had to work on Friday nights. And um, many of my classmates always felt that I was a very aloof person because if we were walking somewhere and they say, oh, let's go in for a beer or let's go to a movie, I always made us some excuse why I couldn't. And the whole reason I couldn't is I couldn't afford to do it. But I never wanted to tell them that I couldn't afford to do it. But it, uh, it made a little bit of a stress. So did I enjoy Case? Not really. Um, I met my wife there, who um, she lived in Cleveland. <coughs> so that was a nice 50-year experience. But um, would I suggest some? Well, now Case is a very different school because it's part of West Reserve. But it really was a very intense school. We used to take like average. Excuse eight. me, was it all male at that time? At that time, it was all male. I seem to remember in the chemistry department, though I was a chemical engineering major, um, there was one female graduate student, but otherwise it was um, all male. And it was all Caucasian. Um, I had one friend who transferred into Case in his sophomore years, an African American gentleman. He and I still keep up friendships 50 years later. And when I looked through my class, a yearbook again, I think I recognize only two or three people who could have been African American in the whole class of um, in my entering class of 300 students or so. Now I switched my, I started off as a chemistry major because I didn't know what an engineer was. No one in my family ever spoke about the word engineer except somebody who drove a train. Um, but um, it's somewhere, perhaps I, f I think it was during the freshman orientation, they spoke about the fact that to be a chemist, you really needed a PhD. And in those days, again, this is 1955, we had to take draft deferment tests. And I took a draft deferment, like everybody else, all men had to do this, and my draft deferment was for five years. Well, five years isn't time to get a bachelor's and PhD, so I switched into chemical engineering without ever knowing what a chemical engineering did, a chemical engineer did, and I did work one summer as a chemical <laughs> engineer, so I have a little bit of knowledge, but I really <laughs> don't know what an engineer did. And then I they say, but, uh, but the question is, did I enjoy case? Not really. It was, yeah. it was a, as I said before, it's just very intense with taking 18 hours of classwork. And, right. um, Pretty intensive program. Yes, yeah, and these were the days before computers, so you typed on erasable bond your reports and spend all your day erasing all your mistakes and uh, the like there. Understood. Yeah. And then now, after, then you came after your PhD, which you got from Purdue, then what came next? After I was, my PhD was in organic chemistry, we called it in those days physical organic chemistry, it was mechanistic chemistry. And I'm studying for prelim exams, as we how to get into the question of what I did next. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the courses that I sat into was called the Natural Products course. And a professor who's still in the community, Jim Brewster, taught this course. And Dr. Brewster drew some incredible structure on the blackboard. It was taking me minutes to copy. And he just kind of parenthetically said, oh, if you move the double bond from here to here, this no longer has physiological activity. Well, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't even see the double bond of how could something have loss of activity. So I asked him about it, and he said, Did you, don't you know what enzymes are? And I said, no. I never had a biology course. And um, so I went over and spoke to Henry Koffler, who was then uh, chairman of biology, and told him what my background was and said, you know, I'm thinking this me I mean, a mechanistic organic chemistry, and it seems that you know biological mechanisms, they're built in, the system is there, and that would be more interesting to study. So Dr. Koffler gave me a list of people uh, in different fields, if I was interested in enzymes, here was the names, if I was interested in different aspects. And um, one of the professors in chemistry, uh, Nathan Kornblum, who unfortunately is now deceased, um, Nathan also was friends of one of the people who was on this list. And this was, his name was Dan Koshland, who um, just died two years ago. And Dan became a member of the National Academy of Science. He was at Brookhaven Laboratory. So I saw Dan was going to speak at a American Chemical Society meeting in Cincinnati. And so I went to Cincinnati to meet him. And we spoke and told him about my background with my total lack of knowledge about enzymes. But Dan also was a chemist by his undergraduate training. And in those days, mechanistic enzymologists were often organic chemists. So it wasn't a big quantum leap, but it was to a certain extent, because I, I didn't even know how to spell enzyme. 
So I basically went to Brookhaven Laboratory, not basically, I went to Brookhaven Laboratory for two years, and I had a very successful postdoc with um, Koshland. And while I was there, I thought I, we were, I was married. I was married in, 19, in 1960, so this is now 65 or so. Um, I <coughs> came to Dan in 63, so I finished my PhD in 63 and did two years of postdoc. So probably in 64, my wife and I thought it would be fun to live in Europe. So there was, um, there was a Albert Einstein School of Medicine in New York was dedicating a new building, and I saw some of the speakers came from Europe. So I asked Dr. Koshlin, Brookhaven is located out Long Island, about 60 or 70 miles, if I can go to that uh, dedication, which I did. And one of the people who spoke was named Hugo Tiarell from Stockholm, Sweden. So I got myself to introduce myself to Professor Tiarell and spoke about coming to his laboratory. And he said, oh, that would be fine. If I can raise some money, I'm welcome to come there. And that was great. And um, so I applied for a National Institutes of Health um, postdoctorate grant. And in 19, this was 64, 65, there was a World's Fair in Flushing Meadows, New York. And my wife and I went there with many of our visitors. And I go to the Swedish um, display, and I found out that Tia Rall was a Nobel Prize winner, which I didn't know before. So here, I guess, <laughs> so I end up going to work in a Nobel Prize winner's laboratory without knowing that's what I was going to do. So basically, my switch from organic chemistry to enzymology was really to continue studying mechanisms, but in different defined systems. Okay. And then well, what, uh, what happened after that? Can take it from there? Well, in yeah. 65, I'm sorry, I say 65, I left Dan, it's Koshland's lab, and went to Sweden from 65, 66. I needed a job when I came back. I interviewed for a couple jobs in 65, and one of the people <coughs> from, <coughs> excuse me, Iowa State University. He was a friend of Koshland's, and I think we met at a meeting. I can't remember the details. And he offered me a job without ever going out to interview. So I, he offers me this assistant professorship at Iowa State, and he knows I'm going away for a year. And so my intention then was I would, re would return and join the faculty at Iowa State. While I was in, right before I left for um, Stockholm, I was invited to give a seminar. It was actually it was a job interview at Notre Dame. So I came back to Purdue, and Bill Ray, who is now retired in the biology department, he was a former Koshland postdoc, and I knew Bill, and Bill invited me to give a seminar in the biology department. At he, Purdue? At Purdue. He arranged for me to go to lunch with Barney Axelrod, who is a member of the biochemistry department, which is in the School of Agriculture. So I did, and then that was the end of it. Um, somewhere about January of 1966, I'm in Stockholm, I get a letter from Barney Axelrod telling me that he's just become the chairman of the biochemistry department at Purdue, and he wants to know if I'd be interested in applying for a position in his de new department. He has the opportunity to completely change the department. These are the days before fax and email, so you read uh, air mail took 10 days or whatever it took to come back and forth. So I wrote to Barney and I explained to him that I already tentatively accepted this position to go to Iowa State. In whatever period of time, Barney writes back and said, since you've been in the time I spoke to you, I spoke with Dr. Koshland and I spoke with some other people who know you, and I'm offering you a position. He offers me an assistant professorship, a tenure-track position, a salary of $13,000. So now I have two offers and one I already accepted. So I quickly wrote to Iowa State and explained the situation, said, I have no intention, you know, I was not looking for a job, this just came to me, I didn't interview for the job. The Iowa State job was $12,000, and I told him the terms of the letter. I said, I'm not asking for a difference in um, a dollar amount, but I just want to know, are you in a position to give me a formal offer for the job? Up until then, it was just a verbal offer, but he said, you know, I will try to arrange this for an assistant professorship by the time you get here, and if it isn't an assistant professorship at Iowa State, you'll be a postdoc, but within a year or two, I can get it switched over. Well, I decided that a permanent assistant, not a permanent, a, a assistant professorship firm offer was better to take. In fact, the person from Iowa State said he knew Dr. Axelrod and said Barney is a very good man and he's going to build a good department and he advised me to take the position here. So I never stepped in this building before I was a faculty member. I never interviewed. I didn't know the faculty. 
And while I'm in Stockholm, I get another letter from Barney saying, oh, by the way, I want to tell you the names of the other four people that I hired. I never even thought to ask him about what the distribution are. <laughs> so you're sort of seeing that my life has had a number of accidental happenings well, in there. That, uh, let me stop you for a minute. The, the department did not exist until Bernie started? No, no, the department all? existed. Oh. This department... Um, Didn't it used to be called agricultural chemistry? It was it agricultural okay. chemistry and it started, it would be 75 years ago because we have our 75th yeah, yeah, anniversary. Right. Right. And then it was called biochemistry somewhere in the late 50s. Okay. Forrest Quackenbush was the chairman and the state chemist for a number of years. When Barney took over in... Um, 65, 66, he separated the function of state chemist away from the chairman of the department. The original charter, if that's the right word, is that the state chemist was to be professor of agricultural chemistry. But Barney was able to arrange, I think it had to go to the state legislature, I don't remember that, but certainly to, it had to go through the university to separate the two things. So no, this department was here, okay. but we changed, before that, it really was a service department and Barney changed it into what was then a modern biochemistry, modern for 1966 times. We were very fortunate that a number of the older faculty decided to retire. The faculty that stayed here um, was very generous, if you will, that they could have obstructed the young people. We completely changed the program. There was five people hired my year, three people the next year, and then I forgot he one or two the next year. The so we really built, though, in the first four years, it was something like nine new faculty members into a total faculty of 18. But the older faculty had the tenure. But they never, they, 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 all the people got tenure, and they didn't obstruct. We changed the whole curriculum. We changed the courses. We changed many things that they objected to, but they didn't stop us from doing it. So it really grew. So it really grew. Yeah. And the enrollment and also the grad students? The yeah, graduate sure. students changed because by the time the new people coming in, my generation, if you will, we were getting grants from the National Institutes of Health. The previous um, people who were in the department, they were much more applied agricultural work, and those were smaller grants and things. So basically, after the 66 to 70 period of time, we're able to attract students who are interested in, if you will, modern biochemistry. Not that there's anything wrong with agricultural biochemistry, but it was more, it wasn't molecular because it wasn't at that time, but um, gene regulation, just, just questions that the other people were more interested in nutrition and programs like that, and they phased out. So the department changed completely with the what okay. the new graduate okay. students were doing. Now let's talk about your research, how that, uh, and all well, the work that you've been doing. I'm, after you know, I went to Koshland's laboratory, I studied enzymology. Enzymes are biological catalysts. And I was very interested in mechanisms of how enzymes perform their catalysis. And when I went to Professor Tiarell's laboratory, I still stayed in enzymology, but started working with a different class of enzymes. And I came to Purdue, and I continued with that class of enzymes. It's, the name of the enzyme was alcohol dehydrogenase. And it's an enzyme that has uh, interesting physiological roles, and one of them is the metabolism of ethanol. And my first graduate student accidentally purified an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase, which was very, very unstudied. That's <laughs> bad English, but it was a very unstudied system. And this is the enzyme that's the second step in alcohol metabolism. And at that time, I was the only person in the country who was working with pure aldehyde dehydrogenase. So very quickly, I was able to get grants from the National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, which then funded me for the next 40-something years, or maybe 50, well, not quite 50, because I haven't been here that long, but it, it must have been the next 40 years. And so I've been very well funded by the National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, because the enzymes that I chose to work with were involved in alcohol metabolism. The early part of my work was much more involved with alcohol-related problems. I actually did feeding studies of alcohol into animals. I looked at various enzyme forms in animals, the effect of enzymes on animals' drinking behaviors. But probably by the late 70s or so, I switched away from alcohol-related and was just studying more um, pure enzymology. Yeah, okay. And you've been uh, got that award. You've got most one of the top 5% in the NIH. That's yeah, I wonderful. was very fortunate that um, it's very nice. I received two nice awards from NIH, if you will. One of them was called the Merit Award. That's M-E-R-I-T, Methods to Extend Research and Time. And what it basically is is they say, oh, the grant you wrote is so good, we know the next one is going to be so good, so we'll fund it already. 
So I had what I originally wrote was a five-year grant, and they gave me four additional, I can't remember if it was three or four additional years on top of that. And I'll tell you in a moment there was something interesting that backfired with that. And then the second one, it wasn't really an award, it was just a letter that I got perhaps three or four years ago from somebody in one of the New York um, universities, that it could have been Columbia, I don't remember right at the moment. And it was a person who was um, more of a sociologist who was studying the people who got grants from NIH and what happened to their students. And in there, he informed me that for the previous 25 years, let's pretend this was 2003, so go back for the previous 25 years, um, that I was in the top 5% of grant recipients. Well, I wrote to him and said, you must have the wrong Henry Weiner, because I can't believe that I'm in the top 5% of um, money received. And he wrote back a very nice letter, I'm sorry I didn't save it, saying, Almost everybody that we told this to wrote back and said, you must have the wrong person, because no one would believe that they were in the, the top five percentile. In one sense, I should be very excited that I was in the top percentile, but it actually depressed me, because I started worrying about, was my productivity good enough? Did I give them their money's worth? And it really, even to, in fact, just this afternoon, I wrote a letter to one of my former graduate students and mentioned this, that it still bothers me of, did I spend the money wisely? But this particular graduate student became a distinguished professor and is department chairman, and I have another student who became a distinguished professor. So I said, well, between the two of you, I probably got my money's worth <laughs> in the thing. So oh, um, that was it. Fair. How did the funding, uh, is funding easy, was it easier years ago? Is it even it, though you stayed with pretty much with the same age. It, it, we went through cycles. Oh. I know the young people now feel that funding is absolutely impossible to come by. And it's true. They're funding at the NIH 10th percentile, 12th percentile, things. But I can recall during the 1970s when um, Nixon was president that he rescinded all funds, we, that he wouldn't allow the Office of Management of Budget, I think that's the office, to release funds from NIH. So I've rec in my own career times, there was times that they funded the 20, 25th percentile. There was times that they funded the 8th and 9th percentile. Fortunately, I kind of got into the grant cycles that I was always getting funded, and I'm very happy to say that many of my grants made in the 5th percentile. So, But there was times that I snuck by on the 21st percentile when they were funding 23. So basically, it was never a sure thing for us, but I think it was better than the times we're having now. But we went through some very rough times, and I recall one time, it would have been during the Nixon administration, that a group of faculty, I don't recall whether it was by petition or how we did this, but came to PRF and said, all the years you've been taking overhead, you know, roughly 50% of our grant went into overhead, and this was to support research, et cetera, and now NIH is not releasing the money would you start releasing it? And they refused to do it. So many of us were really very angry with them because here we had grants that were approved but not funded. Other times we had grants, and let's make up a grant that you had a $100,000 grant, and in there maybe there'd be $80,000 for salary and the other $10,000 of his salary and fringe benefits, and the other money would be for supplies, equipment, and travel. And the agency would approve the grant for $100,000, but say, oh, we're going to put a 15% cut on it, so you're getting 85000 and this shouldn't affect you in any way. I said, well, it does. I mean, there isn't 15% of a person that you're getting, if all you're in, and especially once you become more established and you have equipment in your laboratory, your grants are really for personnel and supplies. So the cuts, and many times, would cut 80%, 90% of our supply budget because you didn't want to lose a postdoc or a graduate student. And I had the very difficult time convincing the um, people at NIH that these 10% cuts were really a very big number, as I say, especially repeating myself, especially since most grants were 75, 80 sure. percent salary. So it was really was a 30 to 50 percent cut of what it costs to run a laboratory. Right. But I understand their point. They were, you know, by cutting this money, and you know, the review session would you know, approve the hundred thousand dollars, and if they can cut ten thousand from ten grants, they were able to fund sure. our eight grants. They were able to fund another one. Right, yeah. So funding, um, it, it went up and down. I, most of my money came from NIH. I did have some NSF grants. I did have a, some American Heart, and some, I did have a grant also from um, something. It was, a, something, it was an alcohol 
foundation and not part of the federal government. Yeah, yeah. But I the primarily one that comes to mind is that Hazleton. Well, no, it wasn't Hazleton. It, um, in I, I think I'm just embarrassed. I can't remember the name yeah. of it. But um, but my my main funding always came from this NIH. Um, but I also had grants from different divisions of NIH general me uh, medicine as well as the alcohol sure. institute. Right. How about the grad students? Has that increased over time, or how did that's also has um, gone up and down? Our department has fewer graduate students than it had before. 20 some odd years ago, maybe longer, at Purdue, we started what was called in those days the PUB, Purdue University Biochemistry. We were the biochemistry department, but in chemistry there was a biochemistry division. In biological science there was a biochemistry division. And the change in medicinal chemistry that their hires were becoming more biochemists. So we joined this union, if we will, that we gave up our own recruiting and we came together in one big, again, repeating the name was PUB. It later got changed to BMB, Biochemistry Molecular Biology. Um, but this, in a way, really hurt our department because a person, say, writing to the chemistry department, say, I'm interested in applying chemical approaches to studying biochemistry, the chemistry department say, oh, this is a chemistry major, and they would admit them to the program. Well, for someone writing to our department, you couldn't be biochemistry hard from biochemistry. So basically, all of our students, who, all the, sorry, all of the prospective students went into the pool. And um, so there was just many, many more biochemists growing on that department, and the pool size really wasn't getting that much bigger. Then over the years, again, as I mentioned, we went from PUB to BMB, and now they have a program called Pulse. I did not get involved in it because by the time it was formed, I reached the age that I decided I wasn't going to take any more graduate students. But with respect to graduate students, in our my first 10 years, you can pretty much assure that you would be picking up one student a year or one student two out of every three years. Now it's not at all like this with the numbers that are coming in now because also the money is different that now the person definitely needs grant support where in the earlier days the department had more funds to help people. So it's, there are fewer graduate students. For my own self, I had many postdocs in my lab. So I did do a lot of graduate training and I'm very pleased with what happened to my graduate students, but I knew that the, as the department was changing its research interests, students coming would not be interested in the mechanistic organic chemistry, or the mechanistic using organic chemistry type of approaches to study biochemistry that I went to a post primarily so the lab was more than half postdocs for the last 20 years. And you keep in touch with quite a few of them? I keep in touch with a number of them. I'm sort of disappointed with some of the ones that I had very good relationships. You thought it would continue? I on. thought it would continue. Yeah. And there's yeah. one, for example, a young man who works for 3M, should be now reaching retirement age, who's um, in um, Minneapolis. And many times when my wife and I were going to fly overseas, we deliberately take a, a morning flight to Minneapolis, and then we'd have all day to spend with him and his wife, and then we'd fly out in the evening. And we've had wonderful relationships when we're together, but I'm a I'm an avid correspondent, and my students don't seem to like to write very much, so it's kind of disappointing. In fact, uh, just today I wrote to one of my students who had a wonderful relationship with him back in the 70s. He became a distinguished professor at the University of Rochester, and um, we exchanged a couple letters, and I wrote back and said, gee, it seems like a couple of years since we last spoke to each other. <laughs> How are things going? And again, it was never disagreements or so. Sure. But there's a group of students who are sort of my last group of students who have now left here perhaps eight, nine years ago. I keep up with them. One of them comes from Washington to come and visit us. And the, our department is having a 75th reunion this October. So I'm inviting all these people to come stay at my house. I hope they all come. I'm not sure if I can get them all into my house. <laughs> but I, well, I'm, I'm now, I think they're probably all too old to throw sleeping bags on the floor. But we'll get the first come, first serve to be we'll staying at the happens, house. Right? But I, I'm hoping we can get a number of sure. them. There's another student who um, became a distinguished professor at the University of Michigan who um, decided he wanted to really work in San Diego and gave up his distinguished professorship and moved to San Diego. My wife and I um, had to be in California over the last Christmas break. We went down and spent a couple of days with him. And here we have a very personal relationship. This is a Chinese-born student, and he and his wife were married in our house. His children write to us and call us Grandma Esther and Grandpa Hang, so sure. we have a much more intimate relationship sure. with him. He's more like a nephew. But, uh, but I, 
I've kept up with, I try to keep up with the students, but there's really only three or four of them that we really are in Overall, continuing. Overall, there are just a, a, a cluster of them that seem to be continuing steady sort of thing. Yeah. The, and the, that the pattern seems to go. Yeah, the, and it's just, and I met, and then I'm trying to think if they were all Asian, though they're not all Asian, but um, it's just for whatever reason, I mean, some people like to write and some people don't I know, go there. that's right. <laughs> Let's talk about that um, uh, Institute of Advanced Study at, uh, at La Trobe. Oh, um, this goes back in 2004. Um, my wife and I were thinking, I went on one sabbatical since I came to Purdue. In 1973, I went to Bern, Switzerland for six months. And that was fun living time. And the research didn't go as I wanted to. And what I wrote to the laboratory, I knew the director of the laboratory and someone who I've met a number of times. He actually came and gave a seminar here. He stayed at my house. But and I proposed what I would like to do, and it was, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. When I got there, it says, oh, we're no, no longer interested in doing these things. So scientifically, it didn't work out very well. And then for what number of personal reasons, I chose not to go on any more um, sabbaticals. And the main reason was my wife is a clinical psychologist who had her own practice, and I felt it would be unfair to take her away from her practice. And when I mentioned this to her, she was always a little disappointed in me. She said, well, you never asked. You know, and I realized that I, I never did, yeah. but I just felt that it wasn't fair to, um, sure. to do that. So um, I thought in '04 that I wanted to go on sabbatical again. And a number of the reasons is it was thinking, you know, I've been a very active member of this department, and I wanted to get away for a period of time to really see would I miss not being in all the discussions, worrying about who we were going to hire, worrying about what the direction of the department was. So I had this um, acquaintance of mine who was chairman of the biochemistry department at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. And I know that Nick went on many sabbaticals. And I just wrote him a letter and said, you know, Nick, you know, as you're getting older in life, did you find the sabbaticals are still worth it and what have you? And he wrote, oh, really important. He says, why don't you come here? He says, I'll see if I can get you an appointment at the Institute of Advanced Studies. Well, I really, I'm not sure if I subconsciously thought about going to Australia or not. I think I probably was. But that sounded very good. So I wrote a proposal, and I was accepted to go there. I was very, now La Trobe is on the outskirts of Melbourne. It's not in downtown Melbourne. So um, you can walk across campus and see fax and kangaroos running around, but uh, you didn't see museums and the like. But it was kind of, it was so fun just to be in another country. So I get this appointment at the Institute of Advanced Studies. And I was really nervous about this. I think, boy, the only Institute of Advanced Studies I know was at Princeton. And you know, there's this Einstein sat in one corner. And I thought, you know, God, when you so hear those terms, you think of Princeton right off. That's right. You know, so, um, so I'm reading about the people who had appointments there and reading about their research and figuring, OK, I have to be knowledgeable and talk to them. When I got there, there was one other, there was a Danish scientist who was in, um, in an area of biological science, uh, far enough from me, but enough that we can talk to each other. And none of the other people even hung around the Institute. The Institute was a separate building. And it was a great disappointment, because I thought I would interact with these people. I thought that people at the university, not that I was such a well-known person, but somebody from the graduate school would come and talk to me of what is the graduate school of Purdue like, or just something sure. no one did at all. And so I have this wonderful title of being a fellow of the Institute, but it really turned out to be a big nothing. It turned out to be a big something because they paid my way over there. They gave me an apartment with free rent and utilities. Uh, and of course, I paid my wife's transportation, but so we lived rent-free and, for me, transportation-free. Um, after, when I was leaving, I met was with... Was this for six months? Or six eight? months. Okay. We, we chose to go for six months. Yeah. And um, coming back, and uh, we came in January '05, and coming back in um, July... And I met with the director of the institute, who I got to know. Uh, we went to her house a couple times for dinner. She came to our house for dinner. And I gave her my mild complaints about that it really wasn't an institute and things. And then sometime, uh, maybe within the last six or eight months, there was a new director of the institute, and he wrote to all the old fellows and asked them their views. This is after you had come this back? This is after I come back, yes. It's just, um, it would have been sometime in um, 08. And... I thought I ought to be honest and tell him what I liked and didn't like about it. And um, he wrote back and said, well, these were my thoughts also. So I mean, I think they were reappraising that they couldn't just have something by name. But it was wonderful because it brought over uh, six or eight people. Who they, but I felt guilty because they paid a you know, 
$2,000 by transportation and say $500 rent, whatever that would be the equivalent of, and they got little out of me other than yeah. writing my you name and showing my picture. Yeah, you know. expected more input. I thought I, would, I really thought that I would Did you know, you get, get a chance to interact with all, any of the students? Or not I interested? interacted with some people in the biochem department, so my host was in biochemistry. Okay. I was not planning to do wet chemistry, if you will. I wasn't going to work in the laboratory. And I realized it's difficult to hang out in someone's laboratory if you're not a bench person. So I couldn't quite find my way of really fitting in. I went to the weekly group meetings. I went whenever a student gave a presentation. Um, their system is a different education, what we would call seniors in college, as their honors students, and they did all research. I tried interacting with these people. I gave a couple of seminars in the, de mm -hmm. um, the department and at the institute, so I did that. But it, um, it, without the definite research plan, uh, it was a, I was planning to do some more serious writing of trying to do some textbook writing, and I tried doing that, but it, it didn't work out as well, not because of them, it was because of me that it just wasn't working sure. out well. So it turned out to be a lovely time for me. I realized that I would not miss being involved in the, the daily activities of the department, and that gave me the feeling that I would be ready for thinking about retirement. It, it was worth going to. It was worth going to, right, to realize yeah. I didn't have to stay forever. Sure. Kind of thing. Yeah, some department heads, it would, uh, Bernard Axelrod, he was here for a long time. Well, Barney was my chairman for about seven years. He was at Purdue for many, many years. Yeah, about 1954 to 1980. Well, of course, a number of the, yeah, but uh, he stepped down as chairman in about 73 or oh, so. Okay. I don't remember the exact year, but I came 66, and he was here for roughly seven years. Sure. And then after Barney stepped down, I had the pleasure of being on the search committee, and we wanted to go outside, and which we did. And if I can tell you a story about that, um, our leading candidate was a woman. And a very, you very... You want this on the tape? You, 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 you'll decide if you want to leave this out. Was a, um, a, a woman biochemist. She would have probably been in her 50s at that time. And um, the dean at that time and the associate deans, they were very uneasy with us bringing in a woman's name. And I remember one time we're leaving the meeting at the ag school, and the dean and this associate dean pulls me aside, and they ask me... Or, bother with this person's name. Um, you, know, you guys are building an annex on your building. Do you think Dr. So-and-so is capable of doing this? And this really angered me, and I looked at him and says, I don't know about Dr. So-and-so, but I know my wife could, and stormed off. Well, it turned out that um, uh, I don't remember if she got another position before we offered her the job or not, but we ended up um, hiring Don Carlson, who came from Case Western Reserve, which is by pure coincidence where I did my undergraduate work at Case, but Don was in the medical school, which is really part of Western Reserve, yeah. and he came and was chairman for roughly seven more years. Uh -huh. yeah. And after he stepped down as chairman, uh, we were pretty much told by the then Dean Liska that we had to do an internal search, and we went through you know, it's about four people, as best I remember, in the department who said they wanted to be, they would like to have their name put up, and trouble with internal people is you know them very well, <laughs> and so everybody had reasons for not wanting somebody, and yeah, we did select um, one of the people, and Mark Hermanson then was main chairman for probably about 23, 25 years mm -hmm. until um, he stepped down. Right. Then another internal, actually after him, the dean said we could go external, but um, this would be seven, eight years ago, and unfortunately the department wasn't doing that well. Many of my colleagues didn't have grants. And um, we tried to get people from outside. You know, biochemistry is found in colleges of agriculture, but it's also found in medical schools. And medical schools use a different decimal system than we do. If we talk about $100,000, they talk about a million dollars. And our dean, I don't think, was really mentally prepared for the fact that million dollars are the units in medical schools and hundred thousand dollars were units in ag schools. So there was a few people that we interviewed but it, you know, most of it didn't turn out well so then we decided to um, um, go internally sure. and Jim Forney um, who was the person that we hired was from perhaps seven, eight, ten years before that, I can't remember the time frame and um, Jim then became chairman mm -hmm. and he stayed on for seven years and then last year um, yeah, he stepped yeah. down and Clint Chapel became sure, the yeah. chairman. Yeah. 
Very good. Talk a little about the awards. Uh, the most recent was the Ag Outstanding Teacher and also the one you just got last month, the Provost Award. That's oh. very nice. Well, I was very pleased with both of those. Um, sometimes some jobs. I ask, sometimes I ask people, they were surprised, or they say, well, sort of, but it's hard to tell. Well, in this case, I was surprised. Um, well, I knew they were, they were coming because I had to sure. do some writing. So, I mean, somebody told me I was nominated for sure, something. Right. And I wrote it out, and I really wrote the. Um, as an exercise, and I figure, okay, the department's going to nominate me, fine. So one year, um, by the 07, I, um, at this College of Agriculture, I was, uh, I received the departmental award, but not the college award. And apparently they resubmitted it um, without my knowledge in 08, and I in 08, then I received the um, Outstanding um, Graduate Educator Award. And I was very pleased like that. I always took teaching very seriously. I had to teach courses that the students really didn't like that much. They were um, mechanistic chemistry. There was enzyme kinetics, which was more mathematical. There was an organic chemistry of biological systems. And by this time, most of our students were more biology, cell biology types. And they didn't really like what I did. But I, I tried my best to sure. make it interesting for them. But it's uh, certain subjects are what the subject is. And if your job is to teach Latin grammar, it's Latin grammar they whether, know, whether right. they want it or not and the things. We're but so I was very pleased about receiving that award. What was truly the uh, surprise award was the provost award. And this is for outstanding graduate mentor. I wasn't aware that the department submitted that one until I can't remember if it was when I received the award or I received something say that I was nominated. No, no, no. Oh. This is before that took place. Oh. So I received, I don't remember now the details of either I received the letter saying that I was nominated or I received a net letter saying that I received it. So this really took me by surprise because what they did was use the document that was submitted for the outstanding teacher. Because um, in the teacher, I spoke a great deal about mentoring. I was in charge of our graduate program for many years. And in the graduate program, I kind of prided myself of being the um, adopted uncle of the graduate students. And I had the confidence of the students that they could come, now I'm talking about my own group, just talking about in the department, that they would come to me with, be it personal problems or problems that they were having with their major professor. And sometimes I couldn't resolve them because they refused to let me speak to my chairman. I mean, so I, there was nothing I can do in certain cases. But I built up, I feel, a fairly good rapport with the students that they knew that I was interested in them as human beings and um, the yeah, like. Could, yeah, they felt comfortable talking to me. They felt comfortable to talk to me. And um, there was even some things of illnesses. And sure. we had an HIV positive student who you know, felt, again, after a while, comfortable to talk to me about his own anxieties and things. and. Um, I have cancer, so and for him it was very easy so we could relate to each other about the anxiety before going to the next test. So anyway, I get this letter sometime perhaps in February, say that I'm getting the Outstanding um, Graduate Mentor Award. It's, it was a co-award. It's only been given for three years now, and I'm embarrassed I didn't know anything about it. So I thought, well, a co-award, okay, they probably wanted to give one to old faculty member just saying, all right, he's getting out of here, we'll give him the award. Then I found out every year they gave two awards. <laughs> so uh, um, that was very nice. So it was a very nice affair. It was at the, um, the Honors um, Award at the Hall of Music. And um, there was many undergraduate awards. There was people receiving Murphy Awards from the faculty. Many faculty received very nice awards. And the two of us, it was a um, uh, the professor, woman, female professor from chemistry was the co-winner of this. and. Um, she couldn't attend that banquet. So I was had a broken leg at the time, so I hobbled across the Hall of Music stage with my cane and um, cane or walk. No, I get the cane and um, shook hands with the uh, provost or what have you. Really and cool. then a week or two later, it was actually May fourth. Um, the graduate school hosted a uh, reception. Well, more than reception, it was a dinner um, for the two of us, and that was very nice because I had my um, very daughter from Indianapolis come up with the grandchildren, my son from New York wasn't able to come in, and I invited a couple of students. Um, the other person had a very large group, so she had about 50 guests, and I had eight, but that's okay. We made a lot of noise <laughs> to go there. And, but they, they had a lovely um, dinner. Um, I gave a talk about, she, she spoke first, and you know, gave the thanking talk and what have you. I gave a little different talk that I talked about some of the things that influenced me in mentoring, and talked about how I saw a change in faculty, and their attitude towards graduate students. 
Then when I got through, I felt that, oh, maybe I was a little bit too preachy and this wasn't appropriate. Then the next day, I get a letter from the dean of agri- uh, excuse me, the dean of um, graduate school's associate and said, the dean would like to know if we can make an appointment to record what you talked about because people in the graduate school were very um, interested in what you talked about as the role of a um, faculty mentor. So I felt very good about this because I was being critical of my younger colleagues who I think but they realized this. the benefit of what you really had to say, and it, it resonated. It resonated with right. them, and I'm very pleased because, yes. as they say, I wasn't expecting that, and that, uh, yeah, that's that had me nice. worried. So I haven't done it yet, but I hope this summer we can do it, and either they'll videotape it, or if they want me to come and speak to um, new faculty, I'd be happy to do sure, that for the sure. very least. Um, let's see. What you say? Are you going to have some post Purdue years? Are you on half time at the? I'm course? on half time now. Okay. In um, three, I've just completed well this week. I'll be completing my third year of half time. As you know, the um, half time can be a five year appointment. The reason I did this is I mentioned the word cancer a while back. In my 40 something years at Purdue, I never missed a class. But during chemotherapy, one day I just wasn't able to make a class. And I felt very badly, one, because I lost 40 years of, of not missing something. I also felt pretty badly just from the illness. And then I decided that maybe I should go on half time because I didn't know if I would be able to complete and what my assignments would have to be. I still had my NIH grants. I had a couple postdocs in my lab. And so the NIH grant brought in a reasonable amount of my salary. And um, my chairmen were very happy to keep that money, of course. Good. And um, then last May, a year ago, I decided to close down the lab. And my grant actually runs out of money the end of May 09, so this month and just oh, a couple month, more weeks. Yeah. So in this month, I will officially have no grants, which is very strange because earlier we talked about being in the top fifth percentile <laughs> and now to find that I'm in the zero percentile. <laughs> or the so it's a very strange type of feeling. The other part that's strange, I realized this summer I received no pay. It'll be the first time since I'm 14 that I haven't worked in the summer. So, it's, But these are just, okay. we all know we reach this at some stage yeah. in life, and sure. it has to come about. Tell us so about your family. Did you have, they had two children? I have two children. Did they come to they go to Purdue? My oldest daughter went to Purdue. I have, I have one's a daughter. My oldest child's a daughter. She went to Purdue, studied elementary education. We live in West Lafayette, so she felt... Um, Susanna will be 41 this year, so we can go back to what years it was. She felt that she knew Garcia's pizza, so therefore she knew Purdue. And she, we told her she had to live in a dormitory for a minimum of one year. She ended up living two or three years. I can't remember now in the dormitory. And she found Purdue was more than Garcia's pizza, and she just had a wonderful time here. <laughs> My son, Alex, who is three years younger, he'll be 38 this year, he wanted to go to Indiana University, which he did. He um, studied... Um, it was political science and European history. I think he had a wonderful education. He never had a Friday class. I asked him, is it, I mean, you never went to class on Friday? He said, no, I never was assigned a Friday class. So I think, boy, that's quite different than my undergraduate days and certainly <laughs> different than my Purdue days. And I never taught on Saturday, but when I was a graduate student, I had <laughs> Saturday classes. But anyway, so Alex went to IU. I have two grandchildren. My married daughter lives in, in Carmel, and my grandson is just an avid Purdue fan because both his, his dad was a student here also and that's where my daughter met him and Ryan is just pro Purdue pro Purdue he's a very good athlete and he's he'll be 13 years old now and um, he was playing whatever small league basketball and his team was called the Hoosiers and when you saw underneath his Hoosier glass, he had a Purdue sweatshirt. And my wife and I bought him a sweatshirt that says, Friends don't let friends go to Bloomington. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so, it's, so I'm thinking, oh boy, I just hope that you know, Ryan will consider IU. <laughs> but I, I, who knows what he's going to do in five sure. more years. Um, then um, my daughter, you see, her degree was in elementary education. She moved to Cleveland to be with her then boyfriend, fiance, and ultimately husband. But she never found a job in teaching. It was just during very bad economic times in Cleveland. She did have some other interesting jobs in the real estate, not as not selling real estate, sure. but things that service to real estate agent, it, rate real estate industry. And then when she had children, she decided to be a stay-at-home mom. And as I mentioned, the kids are now 13 and um, mm-hmm. 10, or will be soon 13. My son Alex. Um, went to work. He got his. He worked in for a few years after he got out of school in Washington and had a number of internships and then worked for some law companies and decided that he didn't want to be a lawyer, he wanted to be in business. So he came back to IU and got an MBA 
then worked for From a Kelly school at the Kelly. Oh no, uh, yeah, Kelly, Kelly, right. and um, marketing was his um, specialty. And then he went to work in New Jersey for a large international food company. Became a brand manager for one of the products. Then one day we're talking on the phone. He said, "Oh, by the way, Dad, did I tell you Friday is my last day at work?" I said, "No, I don't think you mentioned this." Is oh, there's some things that I want to do on my own, so I'm leaving. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so uh, I said, "You know, I just thinking of the difference between us, and I think it's just different in the economic times." I would not have left until I had the new thing completely in shape where he left and then started to plan his new thing. But I taught my children to be fairly good savers, so they never had to ask us for anything. So he went in. And he's doing very well in um, his own self now. And uh, he does what's something called brand extension and um, works for himself in his office as a cell phone. And <laughs> going down. so he's having a very nice time. Um, good. Uh, do you have a, a favorite Purdue tradition? Or an outstanding event? Ooh, I don't think so. I'm going to tell you about one outstanding. And then, I'll leave, and then you can do the summary. I'll leave the okay. balls in your car. However okay. Do um, this is good. It's not an outstanding one. I, I mentioned I came here in graduate school in 1959. I got married in 1960. I bring my wife into the Memorial Union, and there's a sign that says, by tradition, shorts are not wear, worn in the Memorial Union. You just gave me a funny look. <laughs> and, uh, that's right. Now, I'm here the year before, and there was no tradition. <laughs> so <laughs> Purdue created a tradition to go <laughs> overnight. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, as far as an overall Purdue tradition, you know, though I've been on the faculty for 40-something years, most of my teaching was at the graduate level. I did teach for five times or so one of our uh, senior level course for kids who are doing um, senior research. I had 500 level teaching, but these were very big courses. The reason why I mentioned this, if you don't teach undergraduates, you really don't know you're at the university. And as I, you know, my, I have this research group, I had as many as 10 people in the group, which is big for biochemistry, it's small for other fields. So basically my life was really much more involved with the research end of the campus, which meant the graduate education. So traditions at Purdue, oh, in our younger days, we went to football games, those were wonderful. Case Institute of Technology had 1,500 students, and I come to the chemistry department. My entering class was 120, just in just in organic chemistry or, or just in chemistry. So it was a very different type of feeling. So I can't really think of any real tradition. How about an outstanding event? Do you have that? Uh, an outstanding event here on in, campus? In your life? No, in my life? Yeah. Oh, probably the most outstanding one was attending the Nobel Prize winning Nobel Prize awards, and. Um, and that would have been Stockholm the year we lived there in 1965. Um, R.V. Woodworth wins it in chemistry. Jacob Nemo uh, wins it in um, biology. Oh, the person who wrote it, I can't think of it, is a Russian writer who won this. Um, Quiet Flows to Don was a book he wrote. I can't think of his name right at the moment. And that was sort of interesting because a couple weeks before they announced the Nobel Prize, in Stockholm came English editions of this man's book. So we thought oh, <laughs> should have thought about this. Um, we went uh, to the French. I had a good friend of my friends as a postdoc. His wife worked at the French embassy in Stockholm. So when these two French gentlemen, Jacob and Monod, win the Nobel Prize, they had a reception at the French embassy. That was something that, you know, we've oh, never yeah. been to an embassy. You know, you see them on movies. So that was saying things. Right. But here on campus, um, I think the outstanding events is for our first 20 years, my wife and I had lots of graduate students come over our house. In the early days, I joined the faculty, as I mentioned, in 66, the Vietnamese War was going on. We had a number of students from this department. It wasn't always for political discussions, but it was a place that they did. As we started getting more Asian students in the department and in the school, and I was teaching 500 level courses where there was many Asian students. I felt it was an obligation to bring students over. So it was things like we had Chinese New Year's parties at our home and things. And as I mentioned, we had one of the weddings and that was kind of, that was probably the most outstanding That's event good. was the wedding of the um, two Chinese graduate students. My mother happened to be here at the time. And we told them they could invite as many friends as they wanted. And it took place during the Jewish holiday of Passover. And if you know in Passover, you don't eat things that have leavening and red, so you don't eat cakes, you don't eat things. Well, I couldn't tell them they couldn't bring this into my house at this time. So I said, fine, you do what you want. If your God likes weddings more than he's worried about <laughs> traditions. And the part that was fun, and they invited many, many people who I didn't know, many who were in my 500 level classes. 
Well, all of these people wanted to take a picture with my mother. So my mother was just riding on high. I mean, she couldn't get up without two or three young ladies walking with her to <laughs> go to the bathroom or whatever. So I think my mom was always angry us after that. Or why didn't we treat her with that much respect or so? But I think that was really the event, if you will, that stands sure. out most in my mind of um, the respect that all of these kids gave to my mother. And part of it was an older person. And part of it was Professor Weiner's mother. So <laughs> they all had wanted to have pictures with the three of us. But I think, again, this was a time these people were both from mainland China. And they got married in mainland China. I don't understand why they didn't do an American wedding. But anyway, so all they got was a piece of paper from China saying, you're married. Well, I'm too much of a Western romanticist to allow that to happen. <laughs> so we made up our own wedding tra tra tradition, if you will, not with a real ceremony. but. Um, I had a visiting scholar from China. The, the spouse, the wife of the, uh, my student was, um, her, her major professor was here, so we had all of us over our house and my mother, and we, we all said something that we had the reception. So that, I think, would be the, yeah. the highlight of, really of nice. the interaction. And they kind of walked into the mentoring part also, because it came out with the interaction yeah. of the, the students. And in closing, any comments and summary as you look back or look ahead? Purdue was a good place to have a career. I have no regrets spending, um, I've completed, what, now 43 years that I've completed. Um, or I think if I knew the directions of my research, would I have been better off being in a biochemistry department in medical school? Possibly, but you never know how you're going to change. I felt that Purdue administration was very supportive. And sometimes they weren't supportive. I'll just give you one example as I finish up. When um, Sally Mason was provost, she started a tradition of giving uh, recognition to people who got million dollar grants. When I got went to the dinner for mine and we were supposed to make remarks and my remarks were I have gotten I have received many million dollar re grants over my lifetime but this is the first time anybody in the administration ever said thank you. So the administration has evolved and changed with time and, and this is good. Biochemistry is in the School of Agriculture. Um, We've been, our deans have been very supportive of us, so I've been very pleased that they never sort of hinted that we should do more what they thought was agricultural research. They were very happy with our basic science. So basically, I look back at Purdue and certainly look at Lafayette. It was a wonderful place to spend my life. We're going to continue living here. It's a great place to raise children. My children both enjoy, even though one lives in Carmel. My son in New York always loves to come and show his wife places in Lafayette. And Purdue, is, is, as they say, it's been a good home for me, and um, I'm very proud to say that I spent my career here. I want to thank you, Professor Weiner. It's very nice. Thank you okay. very much. Let's go.